Uh, good morning. Uh, as part of our series of lectures from recent advance in surgery, this is uh, a topic from uh, Roshan Lal Gupta, recent advance surgery, uh, update in uh, penile cancer management. So I'll be going through this uh, brief review of this uh, uh, topic. Uh, penile cancer is a important entity that comes as short case and also suitable for your uh, theory exam. So a, a overview of uh, penile cancer management. So a penile cancer is a rare male malignancy. It's less than 1% of all male malignancies. It occurs in one in one lakh men annually in developed countries. But in Asia and African countries, the incidence is quoted to be high as high as 10%. And in India, the incidence has been quoted in different series as 1.8 to 3.32 per lakh population. Most of these squamous are squamous carcinomas. There has been recent developments in concept and there is some change in uh, treatment of uh, penile carcinoma also. Uh, this cancer is common in male in the fifth to seven decades, but this can happen in younger ages. Most of these cases on presentation are localized. 25% may have regional involvement with lymph node metastasis and uh, distant metastasis is very rare. Only 4% patient may present distant metastasis. The nodal involvement from penile carcinoma is one of the most important prognostic factors. The fiber survival from a carcinoma in situ is almost 90%. This drops down to 60% when the node is positive and the survival is about 20% in patient having a distant metastatic disease. So what are the different risk factors for development of penile cancer? And the most important is phimosis. It is observed that Jews who are circumscribed at birth are almost immune to development of CA penis. In patients who are having a carcinoma penis, it is associated with in 25 to 60% cases, they have associated phimosis. What is the role of circumcision for preventing uh, penile cancer? It is already observed that Jews who are circumcised at birth are immune to penile cancer. And circumcision reduces incidence of penile cancer. This is by way of reduction in both HPV infection and penile cancer prevention. Uncircumcised man has 3.2 higher risk of development of penile carcinoma. Smoking has 3 to 4.5 fold increase in incidence of penile cancers. And smoking can be either a smoking as such or can be chewing tobacco. Consumption of both poses a higher risk. It is observed that 20 pack years has higher risk than it is when it is less than that. Chronic inflammatory condition of the penis, like recurrent balanitis, poses increased risk of penile cancer. Penile injury has been seen to be associated with higher incidence of carcinoma in situ. Genital wart is a common entity. Patient having genital wart has 5.9 times higher risk of development of invasive penile carcinoma. Human papillomavirus has been associated with squamous carcinoma in the head and neck, CSR mix, and also being implicated in penile cancer. The HP prevalence in penile cancer is about 50%. The serotype commonly associated are HPV 16 and HPV 18. And in penile cancer patient, the incidence of HP infection has observed between 24 to 65%. What is the role of HPV vaccine and penile cancer? The role is controversial. There are two types of vaccine available in the market. One is a quadrivalent vaccine with four strains of HPV and a bivalent vaccine. Both vaccines are approved <coughs> for use in females for preventing cervical cancer. This HPV 4 vaccine, quadruple vaccine is, is, is approved by FDA for use in male to, for prevention of male genital warts and penile cancer. However, there is no statistically significant difference of activity in grade 1, grade 3 neoplasia in penis. The other risk factors are uh, HIV infection. It is observed that patient having HIV has eightfold increase in incidence of penile cancer. Treatment is sorolin for vitiligo and ultraviolet ray and phototherapy has actually increased in service penile cancer. History of multiple sexual partners and early age and intercourse 
is being associated with higher incidence of penile cancer. Just And condylema in penis is associated with about six-fold increase in penile cancer. There are some uh, premalignant lesions in the penis. There are some premalignant lesions which have been said to be strongly associated with penile cancer, like erythropoietic dequirate, which is a, a persistent rawness and redness of the penile surface in the form in the glands. It can be a bounce disease described as internal epithelial neoplasia. Pages disease of the penis, bounded papillosis, busque launston tumor, it's a giant condylomata, and penile interpethelial carcinoma are all strongly associated with invasive penile cancer. <clears throat> there are some uh, lesions which are weakly associated with penile cancer, like lichen sclerosis, leukoplakia, cutinous horn, and pseudopathosis and keratotic melanitis. What is the natural history of penile carcinoma? As I said, most of the patients present with a localized disease. This disease usually starts in the prepuce and glands. And onset to presentation can take months to years because most of the patient does not present with early lesion. 25 to 50% patient usually presents after one year. Often the growth is not seen because of secondary phimosis. In view of a tough fascia covering the corpora cavernosa, Involvement of the shaft is late. And in view of the box fascia covering the corpus spongiosum, the involvement of urethra is also late. How does this disease spread? It can spread to the regional lymph nodes. It first spread to the suavision inguinal nodes. Some can spread directly to the deep inguinal nodes. The most common groin node involves the supramedial group of suavision inguinal nodes. This Lymphatic spread can occur crosswise. That means crossover drainage may occur to the opposite side. And metastasis can occur on both sides of the inguinal nodes. From the inguinal node, the second tier of metastasis can happen in the pelvic lymph nodes. And pelvic lymph node is common at external iliac, internal iliac, and obturator. If there is a spread of lymphatic disease beyond the pelvic node, that should be considered as systemic disease. Distance spread is extremely rare, ranging between 1 to 10 percent. Rarely, the disease may spread to the lungs, liver, bones, and brain. Most of the patient, if they are untreated, the disease can progress unrelentingly, and patient can die within two to three years. Metastatic deposit in the lymph node may erode the overlying skin, may erode the underlying femoral vessels and patient can succumb to severe fatal hemorrhage. So what are the pathological types of carcinoma penis? Basically, the commonest site for the carcinoma to develop is a gland penis, the incidence of 48%. It can involve only the prepucial skin in your 21%, both glands and prepuce 9%. It can involve the coronal sulcus in about 6% and rarely Lately, it can involve the penile shaft. Gross appearance of the tumor, it can be a just a induration. It can be a small papillary growth. It can be a flat ulcerative lesion, not mimicking a classical squamous cell carcinoma on the other side of the body. It can be exophytic proliferative lesion, or it can be a large fungating ulcerative proliferative growth like this. So it can be a large also probably growth involving the whole of glands, or it can be a, just a flat ulcer, not showing the classic features of inverted age, ages. So there are different uh, gross types of carcinoma penis. And if you go into the histology of this uh, cancer, most 95% are squamous cell carcinomas. And this squamous cell carcinoma may be classic squamous cell carcinoma, or it can be other variants like warty, basaloid, and varicose forms of squamous cell carcinoma. Apart from squamous cell carcinoma, other rare cancers can involve the melanomas, lymphomas, leukemias, mesenchymal tumors. This penis cancer can be a secondary cancer from spread from prostate and colorectal cancers.
this is a classic carcinoma in situ where you have uh, hyperprobatic cells, but they are not breaching the basement membrane. So this is a classic picture of carcinoma in situ. And this is a classic picture of epithelial pearls forming in a squamous cell carcinoma. How does this patient present? They can present either with a visible or palpable lesion of the glands on the prepuce. They can present with pain, bleeding, or discharge from the lesion. Patient can present with primary or secondary phimosis. In elderly patient, recent appear of secondary phimosis should alert the clinician for diagnosis of carcinopenis. So, high index of suspicion is important for diagnosis. History of bleeding or discharge after retracting foreskin can point to the underlying lesion in the glands. When you examine the patient, the examination finding will depend on the type of cancer, as you said, in gross appearance. If it is secondary phimosis, you can find a mass deep to this penile skin. It can be a flat infiltrate lesion in the pancreatic shaft, or it can be a classic ulcerative deep growth in the glands and the body of the penis. How do you confirm the diagnosis? Most of the cases are diagnosed based on the gross appearance. Based on the history and clinical appearance, you can diagnose most of the cases. But there are some cases where a infiltrate lesion or other uh, atypical ulcers or uh, giant uh, condylomas are difficult to diagnose and differential cancers. So these are investigations which are sometimes used for diagnosis and staging of the disease like ultrasound, MRI, CT scan and PET CT scan. So how does the ultrasound helps? It's an adjunct to physical examination. You can easily diagnose involvement of the corpus cavernosum and spongiosum from the mass lesion in the glands. And classically, this appears as a hypoechoic lesion. So this is a classic uh, appearance in the glands. You can see a hypoechoic lesion in the glands. And if you look at the next picture, you can find that this is these are the two corpora cavernosa, and this hypoechoic lesion is involving the corpora cavernosa. So ultrasound is a good adjunct for clinical examination. MRI is a very important investigation for uh, borderline cases where you can diagnose the primary lesion. MRI can give an idea about the involvement of the groin and the pelvic nodes. And in MRI, they classically appear as hypointense lesion with contrast enhancement in comparison to corpora cavernosa. So this is a classic appearance of MRI where there is involvement of the shaft of the penis and there is contrast enhancement following gadolinium. CT scan is uh, not always uh, sufficient to diagnose the penile lesion, but they are better for assessment of the lymph nodes. So if you do a CT scan, you can diagnose, you can see the lesion in the penis, but the more commonly it is utilized for diagnosing the lymph node metastasis. And PET CT scan is not routine for a patient having penile cancer, patient having extensive metastasis to the groin, pelvic nodes, and in suspicion of distinct metastasis, you can use the PET CT scan, which can show the metabolically active lesion in the penis and other sites. So once you have a patient who has got some pelvic and the inguinal nodes, you need to stage the disease. The incidence of palpable inguinal nodes on presentation is varying between 20 to 50 percent. And this enlarged groin nodes may be either infective or metastatic. It is found that in about 50 percent of patients, these are infective nodes and about 50 percent, these are metastatic nodes. So clinical examination is important to assess the number, size, mobility, matting, fixation to the skin or deeper structures. However, Clinical examination are not always reliable. Sometimes impalpable lymph nodes may also be metastatic. So if you see this, that lymph node is one of the powerful prognostic indicator and the regional spread involves initially that involved the inguinal nodes and from there the pelvic nodes. And at diagnosis, 50% patient will have palpable inguinal nodes. And this positive nodes 
which are clinically palpable needs to be differentiated whether this is infective or metastatic. And some investigation are helpful for diagnosis of these metastatic nodes. Again, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, and PET CT scan are very important to come to a proper diagnosis of metastatic node in the groin or in the pelvis. This is a classic appearance of a metastatic node. You see the node shape has changed from reniform to rounded or oval node. You see that there is loss of central halo. You see the peripheral halo is lost. And see the margin. The margin is not smooth. It's an irregular margin of the node. And if you apply color coding, you will find this limb node to be vascular. Next investigation for diagnosis of these groin nodes are CT scan. You can easily see the bulky nodes in the groin. You see, if these are the enlarged pelvic nodes, which can be easily diagnosed by CT scan, which are not very sensitive to be diagnosed by ultrasound. And as I already said, if you have a suspicion of metastasis in the pelvic nodes or distant site, a PET CT gives a good image of metabolically active lesion in the pelvis. When the lymph nodes are palpable, it may not be metastatic or an impalpable node also be metastatic. So in a patient who has got an impalpable nodes, the next better way to assess the node is a sentinel node biopsy. In fact, the concept of sentinel biopsy came from the management of patient of carcinoma pains. However, there may be some incidence of false negative rate for SLNB if the disease is involving the whole of the lymph nodes. Gross metastatic disease, it may be sometimes unreliable. But sentinel lymph node biopsy is one of the important modality for assessment of carcinoma pains. What do you do with the clinically involved node? When you have a clinical suspicion of node, that nodes are enlarged and palpable. As I said, it can be either infective or metastatic. The policy of discharging the patient with antibiotic and review after six weeks is no longer followed. We have to confirm whether this node is metastatic or infective by doing a imaging and a FNA. If FNA is positive, one should proceed for management of the nodes with one of the modalities, either surgery or uh, adjuvant therapy. So, imaging the ultrasound CT MRI is helpful for evaluation. And if the suspicion still persists, one should go for sentinel biopsy. So, what are the recommendations for diagnosis of carcinoma of the penis? You need a good clinical examination, a good history and a physical examination, followed by ultrasound and if required, a FNA from the palpable nodes. Clinically uninvolved nodes can be supplemented by MRI, CT or PET CT. And patient having a gross groin node involvement, you need a abdominal pelvic imaging for assessing pelvic or retrograde lymph nodes. How to assess for distant metastasis? Distant metastasis is rare to the tune of 1 to 10 percent. But patient is symptomatic or you have a gross disease in the groin and the pelvis one should assess for distant metastasis. The workup will include a liver function test, CT abdomen and pelvis. And in case of suspected chest metastasis, you should do a CT chest. And FD, 18 FDG PET CT scan is an important modality for diagnosis of both lymph node and distant metastasis. One important marker described as stromal cell carcinoma antigen is a tumor marker may be elevated in about 25% of patients. So how to proceed with a confirmation of diagnosis? The most important is to do a incisional biopsy from the ulcer or the proliferative growth. And this biopsy should be done from the margin of the ulcer. Why? Because the most proliferating group of cells are in the periphery. So if it is a very small lesion, you can go for excision biopsy, but the standard of care is to do a uh, incisional biopsy or wedge biopsy on the margin. And for limb nodes, one should go for a either a central biopsy or FNA, image-guided FNA. How do you grade penile tumors? Based on the histology, penile tumors can be either well-differentiated stromal cell carcinoma, 
it can be moderately differentiated or poorly differentiated. There is another way of grading penal carcinoma where this grading system takes into account some, some of the parameters. Like when you examine the patient histologically, you look for cell atypia, mitotic activity, extensive credentialization, and degree of infanticide infiltrate. And score is given for each of these points. And from that, four grades of penile carcinoma are described. Grade one is when the score is 8 to 10, and grade four is when the score is between 0 to 2. So, what are the recommendations for clinical staging of this uh, patient having carcinoma? Is a physical examination followed by imaging, which should include either a CT, MRI, or PET CT. What is the uh, recent change in uh, penal cancer staging in AIDS of AIDS uh, AGCC? It is almost same with some minor modifications. Uh, it is uh, a situation where it described it from T1 to T4. I'm not going to details of this. You know, this is all there in the book, and this is now added with grade of the tumor and lymphovascular invasion. So these are the two additions in the HSC 8th edition. The regional lymph nodes, it can be either a clinical uh, assessment of the lymph nodes or it can be a pathological staging of the lymph nodes based on the number of nodes being dissected and found to be positive. And distant metastasis is either the M0 or M1. And based on this, we classify the penile cancer into stage 0 to stage 4. So, how do you plan for management of penile cancers? Uh, this can be a multi-modality treatment. Surgery continues to be the mainstay of treatment of penile cancer, but there are some uh, definite role of radiotherapy, which can be either a primary modality of therapy, or it can be a new adjuvant or adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy, there has been some newer development in penile cancer with targeted therapy based on identification some of some immunohistochemistry markers. So how do you treat this patient based on the staging? If it is a carcinoma in C2 or T TA, non-invasive lesion. If the disease is superficial, the basic approach is a, uh, a penile sparing approach. The treatment option can be either a local excision. If the lesion is confined only to the prepuce, one can consider just doing a circumcision. If a small lesion, non-invasive in the gland penis, it can be managed with a carbon dioxide ND YAG laser therapy or photodynamic therapy. In case of varicose carcinoma, one can consider for doing MOS microscopy surgery. As you know, that MOS microsurgery is serial excision of the lesion till you find a normal underlying tissue. So this most microsurgery can be suitable for varicose carcinoma where you just need to have a clear margin. You do not take a uh, margin of one centimeter or two centimeter. A, a microscopic clear margin is good enough and you can conserve penis. In TA lesion, if the lesion involves less than 50% of glands, and is a well differentiated tumor, you can consider doing a partial gansectomy. You need not do a total gansectomy. If it is a recurrent superficial lesion, small lesions, there is a role for topical therapy with 5 fluoroacid. When the disease is stage 1, the tumor is a T1A lesion confined to the foreskin. A simple circumcision may be the adequate surgical treatment. If it is a high-grade lesion with T1B and there is higher incidence of likelihood of involving inguinal lymph nodes, in that case, one should consider aggressive surgical approach because it's a poor-grade tumor. We should consider either a partial perectomy or gansectomy for smaller lesion. For larger lesion involving the shaft of the penis, one can consider doing a total penectomy. Some patients who are refusing surgery or does not want to have a mutilating surgery for uh, this type of tumors, you can consider giving the patient a primary radiotherapy. But these are the patients who require care for follow-up for finding the recurrence. Stage 2 disease, small lesion, no erythral invasion. Disease confined to the glands, 
a partial gynecectomy is still advisable for grade one and two. However, these are the patient who needs to be closely monitored for early recurrence. If the disease is confined to the glands and not into the shaft of the penis, a total gynecectomy with skin grafting can be good enough for management. You may not need to do a partial penectomy. You can consider doing an intraoperative frozen biopsy for finding an adequate margin. If the disease involves the distal corpora and you have a, a clear shaft of the penile length, you have a penile length which is adequate for uh, a reconstruction of the urethra, you can consider partial penectomy. Uh, in titulation, the treatment should consider for a either a partial amputation based if it is a uh, well different lesion and the previous concept of uh, taking a two seed margin is no longer recommended. If you have a lesion which are grade one and grade two, If, if it is a uh, lesion which is grade 1 and grade 2, you can resect with a 10 millimeter margin. If it is a lesion with grade 3 or grade 4 lesion, a wider margin of 15 millimeter is adequate. So for two lesion, with a well differential lesion, you can consider doing a partial penectomy. But if it is a wholly differentiated tumor, patient might require a total penectomy. Stage 3 and stage 4 are advanced disease. Patient having stage 3 T3 tumors, the European Serology advise total penectomy with perineal lithostomy. In most of the patients with T4 disease has fixed inguinal node, they are not candidate for upfront surgery. They have poor prognosis. So consider giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy in this patient and following downstaging, one can consider going for a surgery with a total penectomy. So what should the treatment for locally advanced and industrial disease? If you have bulky primary tumor with N2 and N3 disease, M1 disease, the treatment of choice is multimodal approach. A upfront surgery is not advisable. You should consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy with, when you can assess that there is definite downstaging and micrometers are taken care of, you can consider for being surgery for the local disease. So the recommendation for treatment is the penile preserving approach are acceptable for carcinoma in C2, TA and T1 disease and not for grade 3 or 4, for grade 1 and 2. For T2 lesion, a partial penectomy is adequate. For T3 lesion, a total penile lesion is advisable. For T4 lesion, in view of advanced disease, one should consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then consider for surgical treatment. So what is the uh, steps for management of uninvolved lymph node? As I said that uh, the clinical examination is not always reliable. In patient having an uninvolved lymph node, there is some chance of this being involved and the risk is based on the tumor size and the grade of the lesion. The intermediate risk tumor involves PT1 with lymphocytic invasion and grade 3 and grade 4. There is 20 to 30 percent chance of lymph node being metastatic. The high risk tumors include T2, T3, and T4, and grade 3 and 4. So these are the patients who might be considered for immediate bilateral profile inguinal lymph node dissection for better outcome, even if the lymph nodes are not involved. However, the standard of care for such situation should be a dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy. So what is that? In sentinel biopsy, it can be either by using a blue dye technique or it can be a, a, using a gramma probe and injecting a radioactive substance. If sentinel node is positive, one should consider for doing inguinal lymph node dissection. So uh, what you do when there is a clinically positive nodes? If there is a clinical suspicion of node, and as I said, this involved nodes can be either metastatic or infective. There is no role for 
prolong antibiotic therapy. Once the nodes are palpable, you have to consider imaging with ultrasound, CT or MRI or a BG pet and then consider doing a image guided FNA. And if the nodes are positive, less than four centimeter, the standard of care is doing a ipsilateral radical inguinal node dissection and a contralateral staging superficial inguinal node dissection. And the limit of dissection on the side of radical dissection should be sartorius laterally, medial border of adductor longus, superior inguinal ligament, and inferiorly the apex of femoral frangi. And both superficial and deep inguinal limb nodes are being removed. When there is end to disease, when there is multiple or bilateral nodes or more advanced limb node disease, one should consider giving this patient neoadjuvant adjuvant chemotherapy. The involvement of the pelvic nodes indicates the disease is quite advanced and upfront surgery is not advisable. So in those patients, one should consider giving the patient neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then consider surgery after that. How do you manage pelvic limb nodes? It's not routine for all patients to undergo pelvic limb node dissection, but the risk of pelvic limb node involvement is higher if you have two positive inguinal limb nodes. If you have a positive pocket node, the incidence of pelvic node may still be about 30%. And more than three inguinal nodes with external extension, the risk is about 56%. So, if the patient fulfills the criteria of this, a deep inguinal node, crocket node being positive, more than two nodes being positive in the inguinal node, and external extension, one should consider for doing a associated inguinopelvic dissection. And this inguinopelvic dissection has got a limit of what you remove in pelvic limb nodes. In this pelvic node dissection, you take off the external iliac, internal iliac, and the operator nodes. So what are the recommendations for limb node enlargement? In recommendation, the, the observation is there is no palpable lymphadenopathy and patient is tumor in situ, PTA and grade one. The recommended approach is close surveillance. No need for doing a prophylactic dissection. But if it is T2, and grade two to three, there is higher risk of involvement in the limb nodes. So in those patients, consider either a central limb node biopsy or consider doing a inguinal limb node dissection, superficial inguinal dissection. If there is suspected pelvic node involvement, consider histology confirmation. Pelvic node dissection, uh, metastasis being diagnosed pre-op, one should consider doing a neoadjuvant therapy and followed by surgical treatment. There has been some advances in surgical technique for this inguinal limb node dissection. Some people have attempted doing a video endoscopic inguinal lymphadenectomy. They have shown that you can create a space and do a good inguinal node dissection and pelvic node dissection. And recently, a robot assisted uh, dissection has also been carried out. What are the complications of uh, inguinal limb node dissection? There can be flap necrosis, there can be wound dehiscence, infection, lymphedema, hematoma, or lymphocyte. What are the indications of radiotherapy in management of penile cancers? This radiation treatment can be used as a primary modular treatment for penile cancers, for primary tumor, because squamous cell carcinoma penis is highly radiosensitive tumors. However, radiation treatment for penile lesion can cause soft tissue necrosis or can cause metal stenosis. This primary treatment of penile cancer radiation is used for disease which are T1 or T2, and the lesion less than four centimeter. This radiotherapy can be either a external beam radiotherapy or it can be brachytherapy. Patient with T1, T2 and N0, external beam radiotherapy can be used, but the more preferred and better control is achieved with brachytherapy 
either applying this as a mold or relative rewards. So the recommendation for this is a brachytherapy or EBRT as a penile preserving approach for tumor less than 4 cm, not extending beyond the glands are the tumors which can be offered a primary treatment with radiation. What is the role for radiation treatment of limb nodes? If it is an N0 node, clinically not palpable, imaging is not showing in a large node, there is no role for elective nodal irradiation. Radiotherapy is indicated in a neoadjuvant setting if there is advanced disease having N2, N3 disease. In that case, a neoadjuvant radiotherapy or a concurrent chemoradiotherapy can cause downstaging and can allow better surgical control of the disease. So, radiotherapy for limb node disease, the dose is between 45 to 70 gray for extensive metastasis. And most of the cases consider giving the patient concurrent chemotherapy. There is a role for radiotherapy for palliation of penile cancers. As I said, involvement in the pelvic node indicates that it is a very advanced disease. Patient can present with inguinal recurrence following inguinal node dissection. So, palliative radiotherapy is considered for locally advanced and metastatic disease. What is the role of chemotherapy in penile cancer? This chemotherapy can be used either in the neoadjuvant setting or can be a chemotherapy which are giving for a adjuvant setting. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is indicated in advanced disease to downstage the primary tumor or for a bulky limb nodal disease which are more than 4 cm, you can give the patient neoadjuvant chemotherapy alone or a combination of neoadjuvant chemoradiation. There has been different regimes used for being chemotherapy but there has been some recent change from bleomycin. It is observed that this bleomycin has a lot of toxicities and newer regimes like cisplatin, ifosomide, patritexel or cisplatin, patritexel 5-FU, vincristine, bleomycin, methotexel. It is observed that bleomycin having significant toxicity, so the preferred regime is a regime which is not containing bleomycin. So the recommendations for neoadjuvant chemotherapies is considered for bulky nodal disease. Surgery is offered to those who respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And neoadjuvant chemotherapy based on cisplatinum is a preferred regimen. And neoadjuvant different regimes, there is no strong recommendation for one or the other. The acceptable Neoadjuvant chemotherapy regime is a four cycle of chemotherapy with paclitaxel, ifosomide, and cisplatinum. What is the role of chemotherapy in adjuvant setting? European Urology Association recommend adjuvant chemotherapy when the implant of treatment is curative. These are indicated in patients having high grade tumors, limb node size of more than four centimeter. So adjuvant chemotherapy is applied in patient who has got some advanced disease. It has been said that 5-year survival rate is about 82% in adjuvant chemotherapy compared with 37% who are not receiving chemotherapy. In patient having N1 disease, palpable mobile unilateral immunodenesis, adjuvant chemotherapy do not develop progressive disease. It has been observed that expression of T53 is actually shorter overall survival. So, regime of adjuvant chemotherapy is also cisplatin, ifosomide, and paclitaxel. How to manage unresectable and metastatic disease? Patient having advanced disease like T4 with local structure involvement, extensive limb node dissection disease, including pelvic disease and distant metastasis. The main stay of treatment is adjuvant chemotherapy. If the patient has a substantial downstage of the disease, one can consider doing a debulking procedure. So these are the recommendations of adjuvant chemotherapy. We already discussed that patient having a uh, advanced limb node disease, poor grade lesions, one should consider giving the patient new adjuvant chemotherapy 
and a bleomycin is not a preferred regime now, is a cisplatin based chemotherapy. So, chemotherapy for metastatic disease is a, a, a chemotherapy based on cisplatin, paclitaxel. Patient may present with locally recurrent disease. And these are the patient who has got very advanced disease and local recurrence is common after penile preservation, then after amputation. However, if the patient has underwent a minimal surgery and came with local recurrence, more than 90% of such cases can be managed with revision surgery. Some patient can be managed with local radiotherapy. Patient having a recurrent disease in the groin or in the pelvis can be considered for neoadjuvant therapy followed by surgical therapy. So, the other recommendation for advanced disease, you can consider this patient for neoadjuvant treatment followed by surgery. There has been some newer development in uh, targeted therapy for penile cancers. Some of this penile cancer can express epithelial growth factor receptor and epithelial growth factor monoclonal antibodies like panitumab and cetuzumab has been used with good results in these patients. And this penile cancer, particularly metastatic penile cancer has high expression of PDL1. So these are the immune checkpoints modulators like cabozinotinib, nivolumab, ipilumab, and pembrolizumab. This immune checkpoint inhibitors has been used and it has been found that there is partial response in about 50% and some patient advanced disease may have stable disease in about another 50%. So we hope for future with this immune check inhibitors. Some biomarkers has been identified in penile cancer like P53 mutation, KI67, any cadherin. It has been observed that E cadherin level has been correlated with immune metastasis. However, these biomarkers are not important for clinical decision making. A, a recent retrospective study of some drugs like cetuzumab or cisplatin has been observed to offer better survival in this group of patients having this biomarker expression. In patients having penile cancer, one need to consider some psychosocial considerations. The, penis, the residual penile shaft line measuring 4 cm or more may preserve electrical function. But less than that, patient may have some psychosocial function of this uh, penis being short and in those cases, is no point considering the partial amputation. How do you follow this patient up in the post-op period and after the uh, adjuvant treatment? The goal of follow-up is to detect local and or regional recurrences and patients who are detected early can be cured with subsequent treatment. And most of the recurrence, more than 90% recurrence occur in the first five years. And early detection is very important for even considering penal sparing approaches and consider this patient for adjuvant treatment. So follow-up interval should be initially, patient who are having a uh, aggressive disease should have close follow-up every three months for initial two years, every six months for five years and annual follow-up in 10 years. Every examination should be carried out on follow-up examination and if required a ultrasound and if there is suspicion of local recurrence, one should consider advanced imaging with either MRI or CT scan. So, in conclusion, penile cancer is although uncommon, it is a potentially curable disease. This management should be done at a high volume center. The primary prevention of penile cancer is by avoiding HPV infection, by avoiding HIV infection, cessation of smoking, and patient awareness. For management of this patient, accurate staging is paramount. Penile sparing approach are the newer concept in penile cancer management. Limb node involvement is one of the strong prognostic marker. One should consider for lymphadenectomy in selected cases. A prophylactic lymphadenectomy is not always advisable. So minimize the unnecessary lymphadenectomy. 
Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is indicated in locally advanced disease, and the concept of using taxins and cisplatin in chemotherapy regime is an emerging preferred regimen. Adjuvant chemotherapy should be considered in select group of patients. And newer targeted therapy with epithelial growth factor receptor blockers are important. PDL1 inhibitors are newer addition to the treatment. And overall, one should consider the psychosocial impact of penile cancer and psychosocial support. It should be part of penile cancer care. Thank you. So I can take a few questions if you have. Sir? Yes. Uh, sir, in case of uh, total penectomy, sir, uh, what will be the, means, uh, the ideal urethral reconstruction for that, sir? Urethral reconstruction, when you do pen uh, total penectomy, you should consider for doing a perineal urethrostomy. You should keep the urethral stump, splay it off, and then do a perineal urethrostomy. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And sir, also, uh, sir, urethral stump should be more than two centimeters. Yes, right? yes, yes. Okay, okay. Sir, in perineal urethrostomy, is there any need of catheterization, prolonged catheterization? No, not prolonged. In the immediate posterior period, for healing purpose, you should keep the catheter for about uh, 10 to 15 days. Not prolonged catheterization. Okay, okay. Okay, Milly, if there is no question, you can conclude. Okay, sir. Thank